Welcome everyone to Good Friday. Happy Easter and I hope uh, you are uh, safely meeting with family if you're meeting with family and um, if not I uh, hope you are uh, going to enjoy a great break. Um, not that we haven't been having kind of a break uh, given that there has been no offices to go to, go to or, or cities to visit uh, but we are here at the end of our third week of our uh, cash flow crash course. We have got one more week to go and this is going to be a super awesome session. Um, as always on Fridays we have got two parts First of all, the module, uh, which is this module nine, and then we're gonna jump into a q and A. It's all about smart investments today, and uh, whether or not you happen to have money to invest or not, uh, this is gonna be a very, very important call in terms of what's happening and where we're heading with the economy in the coming weeks and months and even years. Module nine, smart investments, how to invest in a downturn. As always, you know we are doing this in real time. So we are basically at the moment over 1.5 million cases. We're about to hit 100,000 deaths globally. Uh, it continues to grow. Uh, it's on a straight line growth at the moment, right? Which basically is like that path as you go from exponential to straight line where it's pretty much the same every day, where it could either go but either way, keep on going and starting to increase again, or it could start to level out over the next couple of weeks. Um, but we are absolutely kind of like at the zenith of the entire pandemic as it's happening right now. And we're already seeing the breaking points within our economies. Uh, while on the one hand, you have things like the stock market going, hooray, We've got all this money coming from the government and the government keeps on pumping more and more trillions of dollars in the US. Um, that's not the same case all over the world and actually is not necessarily even a good thing either. And so if you're looking to make some sense on what's happening with the markets, let me first of all just share a couple of different headlines. Uh, this one here, first of all, more than 16 million people have filed for unemployment benefits in the last three weeks. This is obviously in the US. Compare 16 million to where it was in February, which was 200,000. So obviously a massive, massive difference. This is now over 10% of the workforce uh, and they're projecting between 15 to 20% of the workforce. This number is most likely much higher than what you're seeing here right now, but that is a huge, huge number of people that currently are unemployed, uh, and many of them permanently now. Um, this article here, I'll, I'll drop these articles in in a moment as well. This article is from the United Nations, uh, which is what's happened globally. Uh, the uh, impact of the coronavirus could cause equivalent of 195 million job losses. Uh, and this actually goes through what that means for the world. Uh, we're already at 190 million, right? This already happened and we have only just got started here as well. Remember the last crisis, you know, went over about five years and on average, uh, when there's a bear market, it takes three and a half years to recover. So the fact we're only one month into this and we're already seeing these kind of numbers um, is uh, giving you a bit of perspective as to what is coming. Uh, and again, most of the media aren't really, I mean, like you might've noticed, media is actually more interested in good news instead of bad news because there's so much bad news right now. And they always like to kind of report what's going to capture people's attention. So people are almost getting numb to the bad news at the moment. What's really important is rather than look at the headlines, look at what, what it does it mean. And I did mention on one of the, our more recent calls that when you have the basis of the economy, which is human labor, which is productivity, and that breaks down, then everything above it becomes a domino effect. And it's just a matter of where and when the cracks start actually forming to the point where the thing starts collapsing. Uh, you're already seeing that here. I mean, like these are just phenomenal numbers. Uh, this is JP Morgan who have just recorrected what was a 25% contraction they saw in the economy within a quarter down now 40%, uh, which is basically more than the entire collapse of the economy during 2008 over four years. This is all happening within one quarter and unemployment reaching 20%. These are the numbers that they're actually projecting now. We're gonna see as, as time goes on um, that even these numbers over time um, are gonna look small uh, based on what's gonna happen. This is IMF, warning coronavirus will hurt the global economy way worse than 2008 financial crisis. So the United Nations, the, world, the WTO, the IMF are all uh, give, giving out data, very different from what the media and the governments are actually sharing, because they're looking at it from a global scale. And this here, the coronavirus dropping global trade be worse than the 2008 crisis. This is the World Trade Organization that are predicting a 30% um, drop in trade. Uh, and obviously, what that means is that we are going to see the GDPs of governments um, go to, or of, of countries go down pretty dramatically as well, uh, because all uh, the finance markets are based on GDP, right? Like fundamentally, everything is an equation where your balance sheet or what your debt is, uh, is always uh, looked at as a ratio of your revenues. Um, if your revenues are going down 30%, um, if that's cutting out all your profits and putting you into loss, then suddenly all those loans uh, go into jeopardy. This here just came out this week, 31% cannot pay their rent. Basically a third of all Americans did not pay their rent. So think about having properties in the property market and a third of all the people just decide they're not gonna pay you anymore. And that's within a month of the crisis starting. Uh, and we cannot expect uh, most people to be going back to work in the next month. And within three months, there's still going to be a lot of people out of work or not able to go to work. The entire hospitality sector, 
Um, this is uh, um, you know, th this is this is going to get a lot worse before it gets better, obviously. Um, and this one here, coronavirus is uh, going to create the mother of all house crisis if we don't bail out renters soon, because obviously, you know, if you're not paying the rent, all those assets are sitting there without anything coming through to cover um, the loans that go against these properties. And what's happened at the moment, which actually makes things a lot worse, um, is that you've actually got the governments, like in places like America, saying, "Well, look, you know, we'll forgive anyone. Like, no, like no tenant can be." Uh, kicked out of the house for three months, uh, you know, we'll basically say to people, don't worry about your mortgage for three months. We'll, like when you say those kind of things, there's still all the middlemen and people in the middle that actually have to figure out what to do with that. Um, and there's already, as a result of that, some major kind of like kickbacks uh, or, 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 or backlashes that are coming from it. So for example, this article here, did the Fed just accidentally trigger a housing market crash? Uh, by them saying that they basically were going to be uh, supporting the market uh, and as a result of that, like, you know, saying, you know, don't worry about paying your mortgages. There's been all these margin calls from the actual mortgage industry, right? So the guys that actually are providing the mortgages, um, they, a lot of them have hedged their positions uh, on the fact that, you know, that there might be a downturn in the market. But by the government coming in and basically like, you know, putting all the stimulus in, which actually then covers the market, it then means that there's been all these margin calls. Uh, and so now there's all these mortgage bankers who are actually on the verge of bankruptcy within a month of starting. So. So, so again, stimuluses have, whatever you do in a market, it always has two um, sides to it. Like I was talking about ecology and economy. When you're in a natural envi environment, anything you do in that natural environment is going to have impacts you may not even be aware of. The economies are very similar, right? They work in such a way that there's an equilibrium to them. And if you actually start kind of like jumping down on one side of the seesaw, there's going to be things happening on the other side as well. Um, and, being, and, and, and it's so complex that being able to check in on all of it is impossible. But as you know, you've always heard with the medical industry, side effects are often bigger than the effects, right? Like, you know, the damaging side effects are often like, you know, much, much more damaging than the good that the drugs meant to do you. Um, Same is happening with things like the actual stimulus packages going out there at the moment. It gives people short-term relief, but it ends up creating long-term structural damage, which can't be easily reversed. Uh, and then if we actually take all those things I just mentioned and come back to a few of the links that I gave you before, where I said that there are these three big waves, uh, we're going to actually run next Friday a bigger session, uh, which is for the public which is going to be all about, you know, what, what, what are the ways that are going to be coming um, and where these three ways, which is corporate debt, uh, which is property debt and which is, which is sovereign debt, which is like government debt, that each of them are so over leveraged already uh, without even having any issue like the, uh, the, like the, like the coronavirus crisis, uh, that what's now going to be happening in terms of the unraveling of this leads to huge risks, uh, but also opportunity, as you're going to see as I go through what your strategy should be as you're moving forward right now as well. So there's $19 trillion of corporate debt, all of which gets recycled. It's not like someone just owes money and just pays over 25 years. If you've got a mortgage, you can pay over 20 years, 25 years. Generally, all corporate debt never is longer than five years, which effectively is like you going back to the bank after five years and saying, I have to renegotiate my mortgage, right? Um, and it's happening on a, on a month by month basis that there are rollovers or there are, are paybacks on, on corporate debt. And so we have got every single month people facing having to actually restructure their debt where there's, it's almost impossible to do if you're an airline or hospitality com company today. Um, and, and the governments aren't providing anything like as much as they need to globally. Some company, governments are doing it in different ways. Um, but uh, the actual uh, way you go about actually even being able to take on any of that debt um, uh, 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 relief uh, has a huge amount to do with what kind of business you are. So as an example, you know, our company, Genius Group, uh, we can't get any of that actual debt relief in a place like, um, uh, in a place like America, for example. Uh, in fact, the only place, the only bank we can go to, given that our main bank is in Singapore, is Singapore. Even though we do business in so many other countries, um, we have branch offices in those countries. It doesn't mean that we actually are able to apply for any of that. And so you're going to find a lot of the international companies, and, and if they don't have an actual uh, government that's going to support them across everything, which most of them aren't, most of them are just supporting them in their own particular country, uh, then all of these big multinationals are going to have major, major issues, and many of them already are, um, as we're going to see in a moment as well. Uh, and then from there, we then get to where it's all going to start, which is most likely in the retail sector and in the hospitality sector. Department stores top list of consumer companies most likely to default on debt. This actually just came out April 9th. This was on Thursday or yesterday. Uh, and this actually shows you like which are the companies which are going to be defaulting first. And it also shows you what is the percentage probability that within one year, there are going to be defaults within the entire industry. And you can see here that you've actually got 42% of, you know, this is 42% of all debt in department stores is expected to be actually in default 
within one year. I mean, that is huge. And then you've got from that hotels, cruise liners, 37%, ties and rubber, leisure facilities, casinos, gaming. All of these are about a third percentage all the way down. And then it continues on to all the retail and restaurants. So massive, like quarter of all restaurants, like uh, restaurant debt is likely being default. So this is not a small thing, right? And it's all gonna be hitting in the next year. Uh, and it's gonna start in the next couple of months, most likely within three months. So it's not gonna happen maybe this month or next month, you won't hear much about it. But then you see much, much more about it in the, in the coming months from that. Um, this year, uh, downgrades that are taking place at the moment, uh, which is happening at the country level as well, right? Um, so this is where countries themselves who do not have the same ability as some of the Western um, countries uh, to just pump out money uh, because they're actually indebted themselves, where they are now seeing some major, major challenges in the way that they're actually going to be uh, having to, in one form or another, um, be able to refinance or restructure their debt. Uh, and there's already, uh, there's already countries which is going down to junk bond status. So for example, um, South Africa. Uh, this is, the South African, um, uh, the South African uh, debt has already gone down to junk uh, status here. Um, and, and so that's the RAND for everyone who's in South Africa. Uh, obviously, our you know, resort in South Africa, we do events in South Africa, but basically South Africa is like you know, one of the first in the African countries that will default. And this uh, article here, Africa faces complete economic collapse if coronavirus is not controlled. This is about the whole economic situation of what's happening in Africa. So it'll be South Africa, uh, uh, sorry, it'll be Africa and South America, which will be the, the place we'll see the first default. And then there'll be a domino effect as that then starts hitting some of the European countries as well, who simply aren't able to either repay or restructure the debt they have. Uh, and so because of that, we're going to see hyperinflation. Uh, we're going to see new currencies being formed. Um, this is all going to happen within the next, the next couple of years. So this is the RAND. The RAND, like this is, like this, the RAND has dropped since the beginning of 2020, 20%. I mean, like this is like, I mean, imagine having a, a property with a million dollars and something that's worth $200,000 less. Like this is basically how much the RAND has dropped for the entire country. Uh, and, um, and that obviously impacts all the co companies that we have there. Um, but the same is happening in other currencies around the world as well. This is against the US dollar, right? This is Singapore dollar against US dollar over the last week. We're actually seeing now the dollar starting to drop in value itself. Like everyone went into the dollar when they were selling all their assets. Now they're getting out of the dollar, right? So we're going to see the dollar continue to collapse through this year. Uh, if you've got money in US dollars or if you've got money in, you know, some of the other currencies that have been printing money like crazy, then a large part of what we're going to talk about here is how you actually shift that and move out of it. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, this just came out as well. IMF predicts for universal trigger worst economic fallout since the Great Depression. So do you remember at the very beginning of when we started doing these webinars, uh, there were a lot of people who were not really yet that focused at the actual um, impact that the wave was going to have. I still remember some of the articles that I was actually uh, writing on things like Oh, within, you know, it's like, you know, uh, America was uh, uh, one week behind Italy, you know, and Italy at that point had all these horror stories coming out of Italy and everyone's like, wow, poor old Italy. And I was saying America's like one week behind, the UK is two weeks behind uh, and, and they're all going to get into lockdown. And sure enough, we've seen that all happen. Uh, and uh, while everyone's thinking of that and, there's, and everyone's thinking about the health crisis, which is obviously a major crisis, um, I'm now saying it's time to start thinking about the next step and what to do about it because this is... Uh, the biggest economic crisis that we have faced uh, in not just a generation, but I think in history, right? That's what we're actually going to be stepping into right now as well. So on that cheery news, let's go into what we can actually do about this. Like what are the actual steps we can take that allow us to actually weather this um, and actually see it potentially as a reset and an opportunity for how we look into the future as well. Um, so the first thing uh, that I will share is this little quote, this little quote here from Warren Buffett, only when the tide goes out, do you discover who's being swimming naked? We have been living in a sea of debt where anyone can just go get money almost for free and now they're going to pay back. Uh, and, uh, and, and the governments are going to be in that same situation where like the American government's printing money like for free, they're going to have to pay back as well. But this whole story of basically like how we go about paying back uh, and the actual steps from like where, it, it doesn't happen slowly, it happens very, very quickly, right? It's kind of like, you know, it starts like a tectonic shift which is very, very slow and then the earthquake happens and it happens very, very quick. Uh, there's an article here, which I didn't even open up, but I'm actually going to uh, open it here. So it's kind of a very interesting article, which is the history of what hope, uh, uh, happened to the German currency uh, before the mark. So this is like the, uh, the Reichmark, which actually was around uh, and was getting printed like crazy um, at the time uh, before, uh, after the First World War, before the Second World War. And you can just see these crazy pictures of what happened where it actually was holding its value as it kept on printing, printing, printing. And then basically when 
suddenly you had this shift in the economy and you suddenly had all the kids like basically like making, making kites out of money and all the money just suddenly was becoming almost worth nothing. And the only thing the government could do at that point was just print more of it. So it just became this massive hyperinflation that was taking place where they were pretty much changing the pricing every, you know, every hour. And obviously there's been com- com- countries like Zimbabwe where that's happened as well. But you think, well, like, you know, what's the chance of that happening to US dollar? Well, when you, when you triple your balance sheet, you know, within basically a matter of minutes, i sorry, like, like over the last couple, this guy's actually got an entire coin outfit on here. But if you actually see how quickly we've been printing money, um, you've got like just what, for four, six, four to five billion trillion dollars that's been printed over just the last um, uh, two months uh, as a result of what's been happening here as well. Uh, and so we're just seeing this, this, it's almost like, who cares? Like it's, it's already where we print whatever, much, let's just print as much as we can, right? Like, like at the end of the day, it's like we'll figure out the issue later. Um, and when you get to that kind of like absolute abandon, uh, you know that we're kind of close to the end. Uh, and so with uh, us actually looking at where we are, and you may be thinking, well, you haven't got on too much debt right now. Um, or you might be in a position where you can actually service your debt. So it's not too much of a worry for you. But you're going to be running, you know, like either investing in companies or involved in companies where this is a major issue. Um, every pension fund in the world, uh, if you've got a pension right now, do you remember how many pensions actually just evaporated during the 2008 crisis? Uh, this is the time to be restructuring your assets. And don't ever think that anything that currently was called safe is safe anymore. In fact, it's the other way around. What was safe is now very risky. And what uh, was risky is actually becoming quite safe. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. So the first thing is take a long-term approach. Everything I'm saying is not about something that's going to happen in the next three months. It's going to happen in the next three to five years. But if you actually start preparing for it now, then you can actually say, well, what are my plans at the moment? You know, am I actually trying to grow my business real fast? Am I just making sure I'm sustainable so that I'm actually treading water and I'm actually to see the opportunities in the marketplace? Because there's amazing opportunities that are going to be showing up and ways that you can help save companies. But it's about, first of all, starting by saying, take a long-term approach, which is, which is that you're not going to go and just jump into the stock market because you heard that it went up this week. You're not going to go out and basically just start trying to buy properties because you think the market's at the bottom. But you're just basically biding your time, putting your money in the safe places and making sure you're getting cash on your money. And where cash is king right now, making sure the cash as you bring the cash through is the right kind of cash because there's right now good cash and there's bad cash. So the second thing following market principles is actually knowing the long term is about these market principles. So what are these market principles? There's eight in total. And those of you who have been listening to me last year or came to any of our investor sessions, you know about these principles because we were talking about them long before the crash. And we're saying, like, start following these principles because of the crash. And you heard, like, the fact that we've been following this for a year now. And even so, it's still very, very painful when the crash comes. But at least, at the very least, we know that we've got the sustainability through the crash with the decisions that we've actually made. Right? So the blue ones are what happens always in an up market. You know, you actually are in for a long term uh, a ride instead of going for short term. Short term is like three years or less. You know, long term is like, you know, 25 years. Uh, capital ROI, you're hoping that you buy the property or go up in value. Don't expect that anymore. Make sure whatever you're getting into is going to give you cash flow no matter what. Leverage, like where you're actually going out and getting big bank loans and so on to actually leverage on a particular property. Don't go do that right now uh, because that property might have in value. And if that happens, uh, and you've over leveraged, then you're gonna to have to pay back the bank, which is where all the big troubles are gonna come from. The big troubles are not gonna come from those companies that end up basically cutting their costs, uh, you know, not making much revenues. They're gonna come from the companies that have no choice but to close down because they are owing all this money to somebody else, right? So like you might have two companies, one which is making 10% profit, one which is making 10% loss. The one that's making 10% loss could end up being the one that survives because while it's 10% loss, they've actually been able to manage their payments uh, and, 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 and cut down their, their, their loans in such a way that they actually can survive. Whereas the one making 10% profit might be the one that fails because while they're making 10% profit, they've got all these borrowings, they've got all these properties and other things they need to maintain. And as a result of all of that, they end up losing, uh, running out of cash because they have margin calls or they've got to pay back the loads that they've got. So it's no longer a matter of who's the healthiest based on your p and It's about who's healthiest based on your balance sheet. Right? So what does the balance sheet of the companies that you're actually investing in look like? Do they have the sustainability or do they have big costs they have to pay back uh, and deadlines to pay them back on, in which case you're going to be in big trouble? Uh, and then the risk. Obviously, the risk has totally changed now and the risk is now all about operating risk. Like, are you, are you in a, a place where as things continue to go worse? I mean, I'm very sure we'll see WeWork most likely go bankrupt or go into a fire sale or have to basically sell a lot of their assets, even though most of their assets aren't even there because they're basically uh, renting the places they've got. They're renegotiating all their leases at the moment. And they're doing all sorts of crazy stuff, which actually is against like humanity. I mean, like the fact that they're 
forcing their staff to show up at work because they have to try and keep open to try and create some cash flow because they're, 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 they're in these long-term leases. Um, all this crazy stuff that's happening um, is going to be the reasons that companies like that are actually going to go bust. Uh, the red levels, you know, cash ROI is all about making sure you're getting cash on your money right now. Uh, liquidity is making sure that you have the ability to move in and out of those as time goes on. Uh, quantum is making sure there's smaller amounts of money you're putting into the things that allow you to spread your risk in different areas. And then non-financial re returns is making sure you're learning as you go as well. So as an example, I, I know I shared with you, I think on the last call of the call before, what we were doing uh, when we were launching our, um, our program for our investment round. Um, so this round, we opened just for two weeks before we launched. So it's not actually launched yet. It launches uh, in a week's time, like on the 14th of April. But we had a pre-launch where we said, okay, we're going to put $500,000 aside for a pre-launch. And of the $500,000, we're already about 80% subscribed on the $500,000. Like this is all within like one week. And this is going to our existing investors and saying to them, look, we've got a way for you to actually make sure that you've got secure investment, 12% return from $10,000 to put that money into the company which is going to continue to make cash flow and more importantly, where it actually is going to be housed in Singapore, which is solid, we're not printing money like crazy, uh, where it's hedged against the US dollars, so it's not all sitting in US dollars or in pounds where it can actually drop very quickly. And as a result of that, because it's solid and because it's actually based on a company that has got cash flows that is coming in and has got the plan to go IPO, uh, we are over the next three years much, much more secure than even having money sitting in the bank. Um, and that's a, that's a strong enough argument for those people who really trust us and already have seen the returns they've got from us to put their extra money with us instead of putting them just sitting in a bank or putting them basically in the stock market. Uh, and this actually is a perfect example in my, in my view um, of structuring something in a way that's able to then attract the money which is looking for a safe home right now. And, uh, and super important, like when we launch this out um, to everybody, uh, if this is something you want to be a part of and you want to like, you know, see how it works and so on, great. Uh, if you look at the principles of what we're doing and you actually have other things you can put money into where you actually have that same sense of uh, security that comes from that, um, then go ahead and do that. But the fundamental key to the second point is this all about following the market principles, right? Like the market principles for a down market are very different from an up market. Um, the third element, and by the way, even if you only got $100 or $1,000 you're investing, there are ways for you to invest that money in a way that you're actually being solid, uh, where you're getting cash flow and you're making sure you're getting the returns that are coming through from those returns as well. There's microfinancing that's available right now that you can actually be involved in and know that you're going to get a fixed return coming back. Um, many different programs like that you can get involved in, in your own country. Uh, and what's really important about this is making sure you don't have the money just sitting in a bank account because if you have that and, the, and then just like we saw, South, South Africa, it drops by 20%. You know, the pound drops by 20%. You just lost 20% of your money uh, even though you're trying to keep it safe, right? Like Western currencies that are printing money are not safe anymore. And you're seeing this by massive swings of 20% or more, which is just unheard of from the past. Um, build credit while you can. This one, I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this one, but it's really important to know that right now, it's easier to get credit than it will be in two or three months time. I mean, we basically are applying for credit, like just by default in every com country where we are. Um, I have got, I know what's gonna be happening to banks and how much they're gonna tighten things down once they say get defaults. So I've gone to every, I, I bank with about, personally I bank with about six different banks. So every one of those different banks, I've gone to them and I've applied for the maximum credit card extensions I can get on each one of them. Now you say, but am I gonna use those credit cards? No, I'm not gonna use them, but I'm gonna have them just in case I want to use them. Um, and when you actually are bumping all of them up now because people are willing to give you more money because the banks are in this mode of saying, government's telling us to give them more money, we're gonna give more money, and they haven't yet had the massive amount of defaults they're gonna have, then they're all in this free money zone where just having that facility is really worth having right now and locking it down. Uh, and, and if you have an ability to get a loan at a very low interest rate and secure that now, then being able to either invest in something or have that for a rainy day, go do that now because your window is only about six to eight weeks maximum before they start locking down on that. Uh, and so that's one thing I'd say is like, even if you aren't sitting a lot of money, there's a way for you to get credit across the board by just going out and basically applying for it, um, getting it while the banks are giving it away uh, and then knowing that you're secure and whether or not you have $100,000 sitting in the bank or whether or not you have $100,000 in facilities and credit, it's the same thing. You have the ability to accelerate out by 100,000 if you choose to, and you have the same feeling when you're doing, or at least I take another number, 10,000, right? If you're like, I wish I had $10,000 in the bank right now. Well, if you had a $10,000 facility with the bank, it's the same thing as having $10,000. You can draw 10,000 either way. But the actual sense you have of security and abundance coming from a place of knowing you have it, but you're not using it, allows you to make the right decisions now. 
right? That's very different from just going out and blowing it all on something, right? You don't want to do that. But having it and knowing you have the ability always to have it takes the fear away from basically, oh my God, I'm I'm down to my last dollar, right? So this third one is really, really important to basically settle everything down and come from a place of real focus and abundance as you're going forward. Um, This next one, get ready for the sale of the century. Same thing, right? At the moment, what we're doing is we're saying we do not want to be actually raising money in order for us to burn it through the company. So let's make sure the company is operationally secure and structured in how we're going to go forward. But let's raise money right now because then when the actual sales start up, this will be the time when we are going to be able to buy millions of dollars of value for a dollar, right? And that's not because the millions of dollars of value becomes worth a dollar. It's because the person who owns that property or owns that business owes so much money that either their property or their business, they have to get rid of it as quick as possible to get out of the situation they're in uh, because they've already basically maxed out and they want to keep their staff and they want to actually have someone take over and keep it running. Or they have had their entire property taken away from them or their business taken away from them. The bank's taken it on, repossessed it, and then now they're basically going out and auctioning it. And, and like, so one thing about right now is not going out there to buy. One thing right now is to position yourself on the basis that you're going to go shopping. And even if you're there thinking, well, I don't have much money to go shopping, if you start seeing what's happening in the market right now today, you'll be amazed at what's actually possible and what's actually affordable right now as well. So I want to give you some examples of this, right? Um, let me show you. Uh, just, I just opened a number of different sites, some of the ones that I'm on and some other ones which you may not, not be so relevant um, to me, but may be more relevant to you. So this here is a site called Global Hotels for Sale, right? So basically, it, already, it, like, it lists all sorts of awesome hotels that you can buy. And already on here, there are foreclosed properties that are actually starting to show up. They're super cheap properties, which are all like half a million dollars to under a million dollars, right? Which for a hotel is actually really cheap, right? So you actually got all of these now already starting to show up because people already are starting to post them because they're actually in trouble. So I'm on sites like that, just watching what's happening, not buying, but watching what's happening. Like here, a quarter of a million dollars. You've got the ones that are on request are either too expensive or too low. Here, you've actually got companies that are actual takeover companies that are putting up different properties on here. This one here, hotels for, this is on businesses for sale. You're already seeing distressed sales of properties showing up here, right? So this one's in Spain, where people actually have no chance, no choice but to sell and sell at a big discount based on what they bought it for because they're already in financial difficulty. Um, and when you're coming in and actually buying something where someone's listing it, uh, then you're already in a position where you are helping them out. So while you could think, well, I'm just taking advantage of a poor person situation. No, they want you to buy it or else they wouldn't be listing it in the first place. And this is not even talking about the ones you go and approach where you can see they're struggling. This is about the ones that already are out there. Um, we at the moment are knowing that the time when we actually recover from all of this and we're listing on the stock market, a large part of our story will be as a result of what happened with the crisis. What were the actions we were able to take during this time as we shifted our model? So for example, this here is a, this SME merges or S merges is a really good site for all sorts of different businesses for sale, right? Where basically a lot of them are distressed businesses as well. This one is specifically colleges for sale. So there's all these different colleges around the world, which actually right now have got operations have taken place. They've got the online side, they've got the student side, but where again, the actual company has got real challenges with debt or real challenges of actually keeping things going. And they're all over the world that these actually exist. So watching this kind of thing and seeing what's available, seeing which ones are actually uh, at the best price, uh, have starting the conversations up in the coming months with them. Um, this one here, uh, which is all different schools in different places, you can see these ones are all over US where you've got entire campuses, schools. You can see the kind of pricing that's taking place in these different schools, which actually works very, very well asset base wise. You could be actually buying something and less than the price of the actual asset. And then you actually get in the business in it as well. And you've been hearing, uh, if you've been following our story of Entrepreneur Resorts, how much that's already something that we've been doing with Entrepreneur Resorts even before the actual challenges took place. Um, and so it goes on, right? Uh, there's a site here, which is a site which is actually called um, Transworld um, Turnarounds. So this is turnaround businesses, all different businesses that actually you can go look at. And what's amazing about this, like this one here, especially wine store, seller financing available, it means it doesn't even cost you anything to buy it. Seller financing basically means they'll finance your purchase for you. It's like you take it over, you start running it, uh, you get, you, you know, they, they drop the cost and you've now got it. And over time, like you end up through the profits you make paying for the business itself, right? So you end up with a business that can actually, I mean, this one's doing $800,000. You can get it for zero, I mean, for a dollar, right? Because there's already people out there that actually already have got other things. And in this case, they're saying, well, career change, so on. It's not even just because of the crisis and because they're actually just wanting to get out of it and it's costing them money because they're not there to run it. 
Um, and so it's actually costing them a huge amount uh, to keep it going while they're trying to get into something new. Uh, so vendor financing is a really, really powerful way of you starting something and, and getting it for free or for very, very little cost. Uh, and I'll give you all these links as we go through this as well. And it goes on. Like, look at this one here. 1,195 liquidations, 167 administrations, 282 wind-up petitions. This is the UK. So you actually just join this and you get pretty much the entire front row seat of all the companies that are so distressed that they're actually just looking for a buyer that you can then come and actually see, well, what's available. Uh, and the fastest way to a million dollar business in the next couple of years is not starting from scratch and building a million dollar business. It's taking on a million dollar business for a dollar and then just running it, right? And actually having the support to run it. And I know a lot of the mentoring that I'm going to be doing is going to be helping and supporting those that are looking to sell a company to those who are going to buy it or those who have just bought a company um, and actually being able to then really build the operational expertise in it as well. And if you're in property, all of the top ones, HomeFinder, Zillow, they've now actually got an entire section. I just, I just did one quick search on, South, on, on uh, San Francisco. 428 foreclosures are on HomeFinder right now versus 544 sales. It's almost one-to-one. Uh, and so this is basically all of the ones that are on here at the moment that are on foreclosure, which basically means either the bank is already selling it, or uh, foreclosure means banks already taken over effectively, and it's now actually selling it usually at 50% off because they're basically just trying to get it off their books before they get the avalanche of what other ones that are coming their way. Um, this one here is Zillow. So many of you know of Zillow. Zillow is like the biggest one there. They've actually stopped all their purchases themselves, but they have so many foreclosures coming through um, that they've actually got a whole section, which is their foreclosure center. And if you want to see just how how rapid this is, San Francisco, uh, I, I timed out on this. Uh, okay, here we go. Foreclosures and foreclosures homes for sale. I can go in here. Um, it is, uh, uh, here's all the foreclosures happening right now. Uh, but when we're actually in here, the actual number of foreclosures that were showing up hour by hour uh, was basically about five to 10 every single hour that were showing up on here as well. Um, but if you actually go have a look at this, you can see 3,408 right now that are actually being listed on there too. Uh, and so you can actually see the ones, see the pricing and everything like that as well. So if you're in America, same thing in UK. UK has got repo list, which actually tracks all of the repossessions, refurbs, cash on and so on. So again, I'm not saying go buy properties right now or go buy businesses right now. I'm saying if you see that your smartest way for you to basically make the most of the downturn and help other people that need your help right now, you're not sitting in lots of debt, but they are, um, then this is the sale of the century. No question about it. it you know, there's already half of this happening in 2008. This is like way, way, way bigger. And the final thing I'll say is stay on the front line, right? So stay on, now the way I'm thinking and the way I'm talking about this, don't think for a moment you need to be sitting on millions to be thinking in this way. Uh, the people who are going to be sitting on businesses where they're being super successful, where they've saved lots of jobs, where they've helped to build something are the ones that simply sat here, listened to a call like this, and then said, you know what? Why am I going to build my next million dollar business from scratch when it's already such a struggle? When I could be taking over a business with lots and lots of very willing buyers, people who actually are going to be super keen to actually look after this company once it grows after the downturn because it already has a strong brand. They've got a team in place already. They've got you know, like, you know, years of experience. They just happen to have an owner that over leveraged themselves, that couldn't keep the business going, that wanted to be able to get out of it and sell it to somebody. Um, why don't I go in and help that person? Uh, and, and knowing that you can even do it with vendor financing, which costs you nothing, that's an investment strategy. And it means that you're actually effectively taking on, uh, now these, many of these deals are gonna happen. It's just, are you in the right place for it to see it happen? Which is my final one, number five, stay on the front line. Be the person that's actually just, just like I'm doing right now, going out and saying, right, if I'm going to go shopping, if I'm sitting at home and I'm tired of shopping on Amazon, I'm shy, tired of shopping at eBay, I can't go down the high street, I can't go down to the supermarket because that's closed too, right? Like I can't go shopping, so why don't I just shop online? But instead of me shopping for, for retail value, where I'm just going to go buy something and consume it, let me go shopping for wholesale value, where I'm actually going to, every dollar I put in, I'm going to make 10 or 100 or 1,000 dollars out of that dollar. Um, and even if I've got 100 dollars, if I can make 1,000 dollars in any 100, how can I put in $100 to make $100,000? Right? What would be the thing that I could be part of right now, which actually would give me those opportunities to find the right opportunity to work forward with? Who do I know within my network that has got skill sets that I don't have, that might be good at financials, that might be good at deal making, and actually start thinking differently about the future, given that there are all of these opportunities that are coming our way. So I wanted to share that because hopefully this helps and gets you thinking in a different way. I'd love to get whatever your biggest insight is uh, to just drop that down into the comments as we go as well. I'm kind of doing a quick revisit uh, on here because I know my time is up here. So I want to just make sure that we've got um, my video going and everyone is rolling. And like I said, I'll, I'll drop all of these links in as we go as well. So don't worry about that. 
Uh, and the final slide that I wanted to share uh, was one about this whole thing about thinking differently. This here is something I mentioned and I thought, you know what, that's a quotable quote. So I mentioned as I was talking uh, yesterday you know, to some of the guys that I was mentoring. Um, and it was this thing here that every global financial crisis has lost us a decade. Uh, this is very true. Like, you know, it's always puts us backwards. Uh, so because like suddenly all that gains that we had, we have to go back, we have to start from scratch. But this is the first one that's going to propel us forwards. I really believe that, that, you know, while, you know, we're talking on this call about how you actually can really make sure that assets that suddenly have a whole different value because debt uh, is going to be unsustainable. Um, because of that, and people just don't have the holding power anymore, it allows you to come in and actually be the white knight to actually support and help them and get a great deal at the same time that during this process as it's all going on, uh, as we're gonna go through next week, which is all about the future. It's all about what are those ways? Uh, what are the things you can step into? Um, if you really wanted to start something new, what is something you could buy that actually could help you to grow new? Or if you just wanted to go from scratch and do it that way, what are those actual ways that actually you can ride? Um, that all the things that we've been talking about in terms of Society 5.0, in terms of the fourth turn, uh, um, turning, all of these different elements are all now right in front of us. Uh, and actually because the past has accelerated away from us so quickly, it's actually just given us a clean slate for the future. Uh, and as a result of this crisis, we are actually leapfrogging ahead to what's going to come next. And that, in a way, is very, very powerful. But it doesn't come without a lot of pain. Uh, and just knowing that, you know, there's people, I, I just want to share this as a final thing with you, that there are people um, all over the world that are really struggling. Uh, you know, there is, um, uh, on my Facebook page, I actually posted this, something that Sandra Morel set up and a lot of our team have been supporting as well. Uh, and it is the fact that our... Uh, school that we support in um, South Africa, that it actually, I mean, all the kids, they actually get their food by going to the school, but the school's closed down now. So we've actually set up, Sandra's put this all together uh, on a GoFundMe campaign. And what is super awesome to see, over 3,000 already has been set up on this, which is all through our community, which is just amazing. Um, but basically, this is for us to actually get that soup kitchen started up in the village because the schools um, aren't able to do it in the school and actually just make sure people have something to eat uh, and I do want to say that to everybody, like, you know, while you're here, if you actually look at the, you know, um, you know food bank uh, issues and, that are happening right now uh, with the food banks out there, uh, nothing like anything like it. This is America, right? This is Los Angeles, like a mile queuing uh, to just get food because they have no food. Uh, like something like we've never seen anywhere in the world. And this is just in America. This is not even talking about what's happening in India and Africa and in other countries around the world where... At the moment, there's just no way to earn enough money to even be able to put food on the table. Um, you know, just in the midst of whatever you're focusing at, whatever you're worrying about at the moment, uh, just take a moment to just be grateful for where we are, what we actually have uh, for ourselves. Uh, and while things can be tough, um, we still get to put some food on the table. We still get to think about a brighter future. Uh, and uh, the more we can actually support, help others, uh, the better. Uh, and so do give to some charity, do give to some cause that you really believe in. Um, over uh, the coming couple of days. Uh, if you'd like to come support what we're doing with our kids in Tao in South Africa, please do that as well. Um, but uh, on that note, have a fabulous uh, Easter. Uh, do uh, tune in in 20 minutes when we actually start on the next session. Same place uh, where we'll go through Q&A. Do drop a question if you have one. Uh, and outside of that, I want to say, um, again, super happy Easter. And uh, we'll catch up with you on our Monday session on our Easter Monday. And on that note, I will say goodbye, drop your biggest learning into the uh, notes, and we will catch up with you very soon. See you later.